Good afternoon. Bonjour. My name is Manon Larocque. I am the Director General for Impact 5, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. Mon nom est Manon Larocque. Je suis la Directrice Générale pour Impact 5, et il me fait plaisir de vous accueillir ici aujourd'hui. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our lunchtime keynote. Chief Madern Gebucht, Tommy E. Remeng Nassau, one of the 16 chiefs in the Council of Chiefs, is the first Palawan to be elected president four times. During his administration, the Republic of Palau was able to pass at, at, at the National Congress the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, where 80% of the exclusive economic zone was established as a no-take zone, and the Palau Pledge created and enacted into law as the national visa stamped into visitors' passports. Among his many awards, he was awarded the 2014 Ocean Elders Leadership Award for his efforts to create the sanctuary. In 2013, the president was the recipient of the inaugural Pacific Champion Award, an honor bestowed as part of the Pacific Islands Environmental Leadership Awards for his numerous achieve achievements as a leader in nature conservation and environmental sustainability. Today, President Remeng Nassau and the Council of Chiefs are continuing to work to protect the no-take sanctuary established in October 2015. <coughs> Mesdames et Messieurs, le chef Madame Nebucht, Tommy E. Remeng Nassau Jr., l'un des 16 chefs du Conseil des chefs, est le premier Palosien à être élu quatre fois président. Au cours de son administration, la République de Palau a pu adopter au Congrès national le Sanctuaire marin national de Palau, où 80 de la zone économique exclusive a été établie comme zone interdite à la prise et le Palau Pledge a été créé et promulgué dans la loi comme le visa national tamponné dans les passeports des visiteurs. Parmi ses nombreux prix et distinctions, Il a reçu le Ocean Leaders Leadership Award 2014 pour ses efforts en faveur de la création du sanctuaire. En 2013, le président a reçu le prix inaugural Pacific Champion Award, un honneur décerné dans le cadre des Pacific Island Environmental Leadership Awards pour ses nombreuses réalisations en tant que leader dans la conservation de la nature et la durabilité environnementale. Aujourd'hui, Président Remeng Nassau et le Conseil des chefs poursuivent le travail de protection du sanctuaire sans prise établi en octobre 2015. Mesdames et messieurs, veuillez accueillir. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Remeng Nassau. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the good lunch, because in my island country, they say if you have a good lunch and you hear good stories, then you will digest better the lunch and the message. <laughs> Distinguished guests, fellow children of the ocean, Ali, and I bring you warm greetings from your brothers and sisters of the North Pacific in the Republic of Palau. It is my distinct honor to be here at Impact 5 representing Palau's traditional leaders, ocean elders, and the people of Palau. I know I am among many friends from nations and organizations around the world, including many indigenous, First Nation, and local community leaders, and I offer my deep respect and greetings. I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the Canadian government and the people of Canada for hosting this important ocean gathering and bringing us together. Without the ocean, there is no life on our blue planet. Without the ocean, there is no life on our blue planet.
Yes, and with so many existential threats facing our seas, this is an urgent time for ocean conservation. Some call my home Palau a small Pacific island nation. But in fact, we are a large ocean state with an exclusive economic zone, EEZ, of ocean covering over 500,000 square kilometers, nearly 200,000 square miles. Palau comprises 1% land and 99% ocean, so the ocean is very important to our way of life. Palau's waters are indeed teeming with life and are commonly referred to as one of the seven underwater wonders of the world. Hosting ecosystems of remarkable biodiversity, which include 1,300 species of fish, 400 species of hard coral, and 300 species of soft coral. Seven of the world's nine giant clams, lakes that are home to rare, non-stinging jellyfish, and the most plant and animal species in Micronesia. Today, I would like to share with you the story of how Palau's large-scale MPA was created and reflect on how we are managing our precious ocean resources to full effect. In 2015, Palau was one of the first countries in the world to introduce a large-scale, fully protected MPA, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary now protects our entire EEG, an area the size of France. Yes, folks, an area the size of France. <laughs> Protection from any commercial extraction, including commercial fishing, and mining. 80% of our EEG is fully protected with 20% open to our local artisanal fishers who provide fees to feed our local and tourist population. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary was influenced by our culture of conservation that has been practiced by our ancestors for millennia. Palau's cultural wisdom echoes that of many indigenous peoples globally, emphasizing harmony with nature, sustainable and equitable development, and environmental conservation. In Palau, the, this wisdom and these conservation traditions have been faithfully passed down through the generations, prevailing despite many colonial occupations and outside influences an experience I know we share with many indigenous peoples and local communities around the world. As Palawans, we have long known what much of the world is now fast discovering, that without a healthy environment, none of us have a future. Guided by our principles of environmental stewardship, Palau is known to have created many world first conservation laws. We were the first country to ban nuclear storage and testing, the first to ban the destructive practice of bottom trolling, and our waters are the world's first shark sanctuary. All these decisions were modern interpretations of our traditional practices. In Palau, while we have a democratically elected government, we also have kept a strong traditional leadership in which, and which is enshrined in our constitution to help guide and govern our people and resources. With these two different systems of governance, in Palau they work hand in hand to balance traditional laws with a modern democratic administration. And it was through this strong dual system of governance that the Palau National Marine Sanctuary was born. Palau's government and our traditional leaders and indigenous population came together in 2015 to declare bull on our waters. 
Bull can be loosely translated as a moratorium. It is a tool that our traditional chiefs have always used to conserve and preserve our natural resources and enforce cultural laws. For example, we know when a species can be harvested because it is plentiful and when it needs time to regenerate. During the time needed for regeneration, the chiefs would declare bull and fishing for that species on a particular part of the reef. Every Palawan understands and observes the bull when it is in place. The whole community, in fact, comes together and become a part of the enforcement effort as we all respect the wisdom that has guided the bull. Using the bull system, we have successfully managed our ocean and terrestrial resources, avoiding over-harvesting and taking too much from nature to the point where it cannot sustain and replenish itself. A case in point, and many of you may not believe this, it is now illegal to export reef fish and marine products except pelagic fish because we believe that there is a season for regeneration. It was the will of our people to create the Palau National Marine Sanctuary and fully protect our waters from commercial extraction. This time when we declared bull, we did not do it just for ourselves, Palawans, but for the world because we understood that our shared ocean needs time and space to renew itself. Sadly, there are not enough of these safe, protected ocean spaces globally. There are now very few places on our planet where fish can breathe and grow to maturity, where coral reefs and marine biodiversity can thrive undisturbed and where marine species can replenish. Humanity's vast desire to consume and consume without pausing to consider the consequences is pushing our planet and our oceans to the brink of survival. In doing so, humanity is robbing future generations of their right to inherit a healthy planet. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary was designed to try and help solve these urgent ocean issues. But science tells us that we need to fully protect at least 30% of our world's oceans by 2030 to sustain life on our planet. At the moment, we are nowhere near the goal of Dori by Dori. We need many more, many more nations to come together and commit to large-scale, fully protected MPAs. We need to use our collective cultural, political, and scientific wisdom to protect our oceans before it's too late. As a global community, we also need to observe and integrate more traditional and indigenous wisdom into our modern environmental governance systems. They have worked for millennia, and they can help us nurture our planet back to full health. Friends, I know that some people question the value of large-scale MPAs, but our sanctuary is living proof that they can work environmentally and economically. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary has brought so many benefits to Palau including high-value ecotourism, which is our main viable industry. It has also helped empower our thriving local fishing community, which provides livelihoods and sustenance to our people. Tourism and ocean conservation go hand in hand. And as a result of keeping our ocean pristine, we were able to introduce some new financial mechanisms to provide income without the need for commercial extraction. 
An example of this is the pristine Paradise Environmental Fee, PPEF, a fee that is incorporated into the price of a visitor's airline ticket when you come to Palau. This helps provide financial security to our states and assist in paying for the enforcement of our protected areas. Visitors come to Palau because it is highly protected. They can see marine life in our waters that they cannot see elsewhere. And we know from research that visitors want to come to a destination that is protected by its people and its laws, and they want to contribute to our economy in the process. But benefits of the Palau National Marine Sanctuary ranges far beyond tourism. We are seeing many environmental and scientific benefits for our fully protected area. We recently conducted studies that now have shown that fish have come closer to shore as a result of this 80% protected area. Many species are having the chance to grow to maturity, maturity, something that is vital to preserving global fish stocks and biodiversity. We are also seeing what scientists call the spill over factor. In the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, migratory fish have a safe space to reproduce and grow. When these fish migrate, they spill over into other territories, into other waters of other nations, and thus contributing to global fish supply. In fact, we now have data to prove that many migratory, migratory species are born in Palau, in Palawan waters, where they are safe to grow before they migrate to other places. Additionally, the ecosystem services and natural capital encompassed in the Palau National Marine Sanctuary is invaluable, invaluable to our planet Earth. Because of its carbon sequestration, the ocean is responsible for every second breath we take. And pristine ocean ecosystems like Palau's are even more crucial in the world's survival as carbon sinks. Friends, if our seas are polluted <clears throat> or stripped of their biodiversity, they struggle to breathe for us. So fully protected, thriving marine environments have an enormous value to the global community. I am pleased to see the emergence of new financial models and markets that place a real value on the huge natural capital and ecosystem services that large-scale, fully protected MPAs like the Palau National Marine Sanctuary provide to our world. I hope, I really hope, that soon we will be able to fully reward and compensate nations and communities who are dedicating themselves to preserving our oceans for our planet's survival. Because how could we not fully value the ecosystems that are keeping us all alive? How could we not? Sadly, my friends, our oceans still face so many man-made threats. A new extractive industry is now threatening the health of our oceans, and that is in the area of deep sea mining. The deep seabed is the largest carbon sink on our planet, and disturbing it without understanding the full consequences could speed up the climate crisis and be catastrophic to our survival. Small island nations are already on the front line of climate change, and we are feeling its effects acutely. 
our homes, cultures, and livelihoods are already under serious threat. If deep seabed mining goes ahead, we could once again be at the forefront of a global environmental experiment with, the, with dire outcomes. This is unjust. This is morally wrong. Brothers and sisters, I recently visited the deep ocean by making the first ever human descent into the Palau Trench, the deepest part of Palau's ocean, with former U.S. Naval Commander and ocean explorer Victor Vescovo. We journeyed down deep over 8,000 centimeters, I'm sorry, 8,000 meters, <laughs> where we saw rare species and things that have not been recorded before. For me, this brought home the wonder and majesty of the deep and reinforced the need to prevent deep seabed mining at all costs. 95% of the world biosphere is made up of the deep ocean, yet we know so little about it. But we do know of the crucial role it plays in regulating our climate. Palau, together with France, Costa Rica, Spain, Germany, Fiji, and Samoa are just some of the nations calling for a ban on deep seabed mining. But we need more countries to join our voice and stop this destructive practice before it begins. Every one of us, every one of us here has a role to play. I would like to take this opportunity to remind the world of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, a legally binding international convention which was signed and ratified in 1994 in Montego Bay, Jamaica. The United Nations Convention of, of the Law of the Sea declares that, and I quote, the sea, bed, the sea floor beyond national jurisdiction and all its resources remain the common heritage of mankind and shall be held in trust for future generations. Amen. Many large developed nations, including Canada, were signatories to the UN law of the sea. And we call upon all nations to uphold this law and protect the deep seabed, which is designated as the common heritage of mankind. By law, the deep seabed belongs to all of us and to our children. It is not something that can be sold off for profit to benefit a select few. By declaring the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, we hope all of us can use our respective traditional cultural wisdom to set an example for the rest of the world to follow when it comes to banning all forms of destructive extraction. Because ocean protection should be everyone's priority in the face of the climate crisis. Friends, I pray, I do pray, that the world listen to our indigenous First Nation and traditional leaders to help guide us through this time of environmental uncertainty. We are all members of the same clan. We are all one village, and we can work together. Use modern science and traditional wisdom to solve the global challenges we face as a collective children of the ocean. 
I am often heard to quote an ancient, ancient indigenous proverb. We do not inherit this earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. I hope we can keep this front of mind in our discussions this week and allow it to be a guiding principle as we come together to protect more of our precious oceans. Please don't love yourself more than you love your children and the next generations. In closing, I would like to leave all of you with a traditional Palawan chant with a message which literally said, United we stand, divided we fall. There is strength indeed in unity and numbers. The chant, however, will need an audience participation where when I end the chant, I will point to you and you will yell out in the loudest term, way, which means we consent. No. So I'm going to ask my fellow countrymen to also help us with the, uh, the gen. Emma the Malaso Yang Ale Rugale de Mugit Yada Talbara Ale Engungil Mandia the Goli Yang. Thank you very much. God bless all of us and God bless our Mother Earth and oceans. President Ramen Gasau, thank you for your leadership for your vision and for your song. Donc, euh, merci tout le monde d'être ici pour euh, cette série. Nous vous invitons à vous joindre à nous ce soir pour la mêlée marine où il y aura euh, Yves Lambert qui fournira de la musique et des rafraîchissements. So, thank you everyone for joining us for this lunchtime series. We welcome you to join us at 545 in this area where Yves Lambert will be providing um, um, entertainment, and uh, you can have some mix and, mi mix and mingle with your colleagues. Thank you. <laughs>